Continuing. In the second grade, I was in Mrs. Martinez's class. She was another lay teacher with an attitude. She was tough. The strongest memory that stands out in my mind about my time in the second grade is when Mrs. Martinez paddled me. Again, I was cutting up along with a few of my buddies, but this time I was the only one to be punished. I must have had a big mouth or something. I remember being very shy and quiet, though, with not too much control over my words, like a kid. So I got in trouble, and Mrs. Martinez, instead of sending me to the principal's office, she took care of the problem herself. Our first three grades had a cloakroom in the back of the classroom. We kept our jackets and lunches in there, along with various other teaching supplies and tools. It had two open doorways that both connected right to the classroom. There was around 10 feet of length of space in there that cannot be seen from anywhere in the classroom. So she took me in there. That was where she paddled students. As with the principal, there wasn't much small talk, just turn around and bend over. So I did, and again, it was a struggle to stay standing. To a child, a paddle can be a shock. She hit me at least four times that day. In a few seconds, it was over. I cried as quietly as I could, and I returned to my desk, and from then on, nothing much more was said about it. Not by me or Mrs. Martinez or my classmates. I thought I'd be looked upon with some sympathy, but I don't remember that making much difference to my popularity at all. That was once, possibly twice. It's odd, but I remember the first time with each teacher who gave me a paddling. But every time after that is like a blur, though they happen for real. I think I spent years focused on what happened and not how many times it happened. As a child, I didn't know what to think about it, except that it really, really hurt physically and mentally. For a good while, during and after each paddling, I felt like the whole world was crashing down. Mrs. Martinez had those eyes that were like Darth Vader's eyes. She would look at us like she wanted to disembowel us. You could just see the hate in her eyes. She was probably the first person I knew like that, just seething with hate and anger. Inside she was shaking, and you could just read that on her. I always despised her in return. Another issue that stood out in my mind regarding that woman was a special student we had and his place in the class. Sean Gerald, again not the real name. I changed the names of most of the people in this and that's not his real name. Sean Gerald was one of us students our age, scrawny and about our intelligence level, but there was something odd about him. He wasn't very skilled at all in social interaction. We found out somehow that he was adopted and for that and his lack of social skills he was considered somewhat untouchable. He was nerdy and obnoxious and goofy and odd. He was like many of us less popular students. Only Sean took it a bit far. He went beyond. It was like he created a whole new lowest rung of society in the class just by being transferred to our school. So most of us students just tried to avoid him as the meaner students picked on him a lot. This made Mrs. Martinez become concerned. One day she asked Sean to go to the office and so he did. As soon as he left the classroom, she locked the door and told the rest of the class to sit on the floor. We often sat on the floor on carpet sample mats, so we sat down to have a little listen. She said, what is wrong with Sean? What is the deal with Sean? Why do you all treat him the way you do? What do you have against Sean? What is wrong with Sean? None of us had an answer. We acted like we didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> Like we didn't treat him differently, but that wasn't true at all. We denied and denied, and as a group, as an organized class, finally we spoke in unison. We simply denied any knowledge of what we had all knowingly done. We were all obviously afraid of the punishment, if we confessed. Even before any punishment had been described or mentioned at all, we knew she had a real temper. After a few minutes of hearing us all in denial, Mrs. Martinez was resigned to just giving us a warning. Treat him like he's normal. You're all on notice. Obey this. Sean, treat Sean like a normal person. We said, fine, okay, no problem. What problem? There was no problem. As she was wrapping up her warning to us, Sean came back to the class, but the door was locked. 
He couldn't get in, so he went to the window nearest to the door and began tapping on it. He said, hello, Mrs. Martinez, I'm back. I need to get in, Mrs. Martinez. It was funny because the window was just over his height, so we just saw his head bouncing up and down as he jumped to see inside the class. He could see us all talking on the floor, but he couldn't hear any of our conversation. I immediately felt that this was another dishonest situation playing out all around us. Not just because we all lied, but because we had to hide our conversation from the subject of the conversation. Had he been in on it, I'm sure the conversation would have gone differently. Mrs. Martinez tended to be at her most intimidating and frightening when she whispered to you up close. She had us all up close in a tight circle and gave her warning. Then she got up quickly and let Sean back in and resumed the class. I don't think he ever figured out anything about that. After a few more months, Sean was transferred out of the school. And that was the end of the Sean debacle. He hadn't even finished a whole year. Sean taught me something valuable to remember. Watch yourself and judge yourself ahead of your actions. Think twice and then think again. A lot was riding on our minute-to-minute -minute performance in the social arena known as elementary school. I also resented Sean for being like Jesus. He was fairly intelligent and he was perfectly able to improve his situation when things started looking really bad. But he was simply unwilling to do a thing to help himself. The more I thought about that position, the more I hated it. I was being treated like Sean was at times, though I had been at that school for over a year up to that point. It was my goal to figure out how to become less unpopular among my own peers. And that kid wanted to hang out with me. Just like Jesus. He didn't care about the effects of his own actions. That's just wrong. I wish I could have been there to coach Jesus on how to respond to serious criminal charges, but would my efforts have mattered to a socially suicidal person? The same problem made itself known in our school. There was so much to ponder in my youth. Sister Catherine was the nun teacher for the other second grade class. She was nice, so it was hard to remember much about her, ironically. She sang a lot and gave the music classes for most of the grades. She wore old librarian type glasses and was somewhat short and not intimidating. I theorized that the music kept her in a good mood since the mean teachers were so angry and didn't teach music. Something like that. Whenever I think about a teacher at that school who was actually nice to us students, I'm reminded how silent they were during all those years of sitting in church and being mistreated in class. The teachers were all on the same team. A nice teacher was just one of the less dedicated ones. I had no other point of reference for teachers other than those mostly evil teachers at that twisted, abusive school, Holy Ghost Catholic school in Bel Air, Texas.